Hi everyone, as part of the health series of live patient surgical courses, in this video I will show a surgical extraction of a mesioangular lower, impacted lower third molar. So here's in the initial radiograph, we use it to assess and to know how difficult or easy this case would be. Just to make it simple, I will look at the cemento enamel junction of the, of, of, the, of the third molar and the most inferior point. Because that's, this will show me how deep my gutter will be in relation to the roots of the lower seven. Also, we look at the IDN canal and the borders. In this case, I can see the borders uninterrupted by the roots, so I'm not too worried about the relationship between the roots and the canal. We also look at the ramus. So in the green line, we're showing how much we gutter and how far we extend. And when we play the video, I will talk a little bit about guttering and how deep it is and why it's important to gutter the buccal bone. It's a very important point as well is to remove or tunnel some of the distal cortical bone distal to the crown because this will help with elevating the distal root and avoid any breakage or fracture. The red line is show is showing our section so we're gonna do um, a section following the long axis of the tooth and first we'll elevate the distal root and then we'll elevate the medial root after the distal root is out. By following the sequence we will avoid any pressure on the IDN when we elevate the medial root. You can see where the star is, that's where I start my section. So usually I will expose the pulp chamber first and use this as a guide to go epically and chronally so I know where my bear is in relation to the tooth. As you can see, if I remove some of the distal cortical bone, it will make elevation of the distal part of the crown and the root very easy. So I'm gonna share with you some tips along the way. So uh, when I'm doing my initial incision with my left index finger, I'm feeling the external oblique ridge. Your blade should always be resting on bone because that's where you know how deep it's going and where it's going. If it's not resting on bone, you can risk going into the lingual space and you can risk cutting the lingual nerve. As we all know, there are 15% of patients where the lingual nerve loop a little bit high on the gum distal to the eight. And that's why we want to keep our initial incision on the center oblique ridge. You can run your blade from the tooth into your finger or from the finger to the tooth, whichever is easier. But I find it easier to stretch the mucosa and just run the blade from the tooth to my finger. How far do I extend my mesial incision? I usually extend it to the distal of the six. I don't reflect it on the six. It just makes it easier later on if I need to extend it. I try to avoid any mesial relieving incision and the reason of that is I don't want to limit my axis just in case I want to make it bigger or if the tooth looks much deeper than what I expected. So by not doing a mesial incision I have a lot of freedom to extend it as far as I want mesially. It's a very important tip here that I learned from my mentor Dr. Anthony Go is to run your explorer to cut any remaining fibers between the gum and the bone. This will make reflection with your elevator much easier. We're reflecting just we're doing firm control pressure against the bone just to avoid tearing off the soft tissue. Very common mistake is not to extend your incision mesially enough and that's where you can tear it mesial or mesial to the seven. So I'm just getting a little bit of a feel of the distal bone there. I don't want to reflect the distal or the lingual part much to avoid any pressure on the lingual nerve. Now during our courses we always get asked like when do you don't when do we gutter and when do we remove distal bone? So as a rule, the idea of guttering is remove some of the cortical bone buccal to the tooth because you don't have a lot of movement in this area, get into the cancellous bone where it's more it's it's a bit softer, so you can get some movements. So and also minimize any pressure on the lingual plate and on the idea. The idea is to want to minimize pressure on those vital structures. So I usually start my gutter from distal to mesial, so I ha can see it better. Get your assistant to get the narrow suction on the distal part of the gutter, where all the water or solution will run into it. The question is how deep my gutter is. Usually I want to get it as deep as I can see some bleeding in the bone. Bleeding will be a sign that I remove the cortical bone and I'm into the cancellous or the more soft bone. 
And also, if you can get the forcation or see the forcation, this will make it much easier for you to orient your, bo your bear when you're doing your section. So deep enough to see bleeding, where you're, you make sure you're in the cancellous bone, and deep enough to do the forcation as well. And on the mesial, you try to expose the whole crown if you can. Now we're doing the distal tunneling. I don't have to reflect any soft tissue there. I'm basically tunneling my bear under soft tissue from the depths of my buccal gutter as a guide. Your DA can sometimes use her narrow suction to reflect some of the mucosa on the distal bear, just to make it easier to get the bear in this area. If your tunnel is not adequate or you haven't removed enough distal cortical plate, you are risking breaking the distal root when elevating, which makes the surgery a little bit harder. Now, when you're sectioning with a straight hand piece, don't start from the enamel. Start from the cement enamel junction because you will have minimal resistance with your uh, slow speed on 40,000 40, RPM. So what I do is I will get my round bear into the bubble chamber. It's like doing a re um, an endodontic axis, but from the buccal side. Because once I expose the pulp chamber, then I can orient myself. I know how far epically I need to go and how, mu how far chronally I need to go. So you can see now I'm getting into the pulp chamber. Once you see some bleeding from the crown, you can see this round area there. That's where the pulp chamber is. So now I know I need to go a little bit epical to that, this distance, and a little bit more coronal as well. And it's much easier to undermine the enamel and move from inside to the outside. If you try to cut through the enamel with round bear and 40,000 RPM, it can overheat your bear very easily or your hand piece, and it can take a little bit longer. But with this way, it's safer, quicker, and you have more orientation, and you know where you are cutting into the tooth. And of course, magnification. This surgery is done under 3.5x magnification. Magnification helps a lot with um, extra lighting as well. So I'm just working my bear chronally and epically as well. Lingually, we want to go maybe 90% of the way. You don't want to go all the way through because you can't see really well and there's a risk you can go through the lingual plate or the lingual mucosa and, and, and you can injure the lingual nerve. It's very important to protect the soft tissue or the lip, especially if the patient is under general anesthetic. It's very easy to burn the patient's lip. So always rest your handpiece on your um, retractor. Now I'm doing a little bit more tunneling on the distal. I'm just extending my section a little bit more epical as well. I like to use laxators more than couplings. I feel more comfortable. It depends on what you're used to. Now we're just doing a little bit of rotation. We're trying to lift this distal root on a distal buccal direction or distal direction. We want to avoid lifting it to the lingual direction so don't, we don't break the lingual plate, especially if it's too thin. A bit of rotation, clockwise, anticlockwise, and the root will give you a sign which direction it wants to, to go out following its curvature. You can see now it's going out very easily. If you haven't removed enough distal cortical bone, this can be a bit harder. Now I'm lifting the mesial root or the mesial part of the tooth. I'm trying from front, front of the patient. Ideally, I need to go a little bit behind the patient, but I'm, I was a little bit lazy then. Then eventually I will move behind the patient to get better access where I can get my elevator under the, under the mesial part of the crown and elevate the root distally. So once I get behind the patient, I have much better control. I like to use laxators. They have very narrow tips. Some surgeons don't like using them because if you slip, it has a very narrow um, cutting edge where you can easily injure the floor of the mouth or, 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 or the tongue. Coplans tend to have a flat end, so the risk of damage is much less. But I prefer laxator myself because of the thin tip. I can engage it much easier under the roots and under the, uh, the crowns. So now the mesial part is being delivered. So if you have an adequate gutter, adequate distal bone removal and a good section, um, the surgery can be very easy and with minimal complication. Now I'm just cleaning some of the soft tissues around the crown. You can see the mesial root had two roots on it, and the distal root was, I think, around one root. Now we're just cleaning under the flap. 
using some silane irrigation. I use my handpiece without the bear just to irrigate. Of course, if you don't have this setup, your assistant can have an extra syringe where it can, she can do extra irrigation for you. Now, that's a very important tip. I usually place one stitch distal to the seven. It's very important to place one distal to the seven because you want to get this keratinized tissue to cover the distal and the buccal portion of the crown. We're not aiming for primary closure because the tooth was partially erupted. If the tooth was completely impacted, then you get primary closure. If you try to attempt primary closure, you're going to block the vestibule and it can break the stitch very easily. If you don't stitch the distal part of the seven, then you risk losing these keratinized tissues and you risk getting pockets distal to the seven. Some people like to place more stitches on the distal. I've been tra uh, my training was purely to place only one stitch on the distal of the seven and avoid the more distal area just to avoid engaging or running your needle close or through the lingual nerve. So one stitch and you can see the keratinized tissues on the distal of the seven and it's all done. So I hope you find this uh, video useful and uh, if you like the video please share it, like our Facebook page, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're interested to attend any of our live patient courses, please check our website. Thank you for watching.